Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's really lovely to see you all this morning. Uh, a really warm welcome. Uh, whether you're here for your first time, whether you're watching online, uh, or if you're a regular here, it's lovely to see you. Uh, if we haven't met before, my name's Tim. Uh, I'm the curate here. Um, and it's my privilege to lead the start of our service together. Um, in a moment, we're going to encourage each other in song, and we'll remind each other that we have much to rejoice in. We have much to rejoice in as a people who have come together from all different backgrounds, who have had all different sorts of weeks, some good weeks, some hard weeks, yet we can all rejoice because we are people of the risen king. We have a king who rules and reigns, who we can sing his praises, and we can sing it with joy. So let's stand if you're able, and we'll sing this song together, Come People of the Risen King. Father, we thank you and we praise you that we can gather as your people with brothers and sisters here in this building and all around the world. Lord, we thank you that so many people are praising you, the Lord, the King, the ruler of all. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do take a seat. And one of the, the key reasons that we rejoice, uh, we sung it there in the second verse, is because we know that Christ's perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease. And we come before him now in a, a time of confession, and we come before him with our real lives, knowing that we have sinned day after day after day, that we have mu many ways that we have failed him, that we have failed others. But we know, as we pray, that Christ's perfect love will never change, 
and his mercies never cease. So let's pray this prayer together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scriptures say, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you that you are so great in faithfulness to us, that you never change, that you love us despite our sin and wrongdoing. We thank you that as we turn to you, we have a God of mercy who shows us great kindness despite the many ways we fail. We praise you for this assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the verse that I just read were from uh, Lamentations chapter 3, and we're going to sing uh, those verses to each other now. So let's stand if we can and sing this song together. In a moment, um, we've got our church family news, but before then, uh, I've got some bans of marriage to publish. I published the bans of marriage between Sophie Julia Ruth and Oliver Sam Overton uh, of the parish of Holy Trinity, Sutton Coalfield. Um, and I also published the bans of marriage between Amy Louise Bridge and Richard Ross Fraser, uh, both of the parish of St. Francis Ashton. This is the first time of asking. Uh, if any of you know any reason in law why they not, may not marry, you are to declare it now. Let me pray for these couples. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Sophie and Oliver. We thank you for Amy and Richard. Lord, we praise you that you know them, that you love them. Lord, we ask that um, you would be preparing them uh, for a lifelong marriage of giving themselves over to each other. Lord, please, we pray, would you be showing all people around 
a little glimpse of the love that Christ has for his church through their, these marriages. Please help them as they prepare. Please help them as they prepare for their wedding days and as they prepare for married lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, a few uh, bits of church family news. Um, firstly is, I don't know about you, but uh, I find it really helpful uh, to have the support of others in prayer, uh, particularly um, praying for things that perhaps aren't always on my heart and on my mind. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we have um, central prayer each month. Uh, that's our monthly benefits prayer meeting, and it's happening this Wednesday. And it's a chance to encourage each other as we pray to the Lord, entrusting all things to the Lord who reigns over all. Um, so please do join us this Wednesday. And the pattern's slightly different to normal, um, or how it has been previously. So at 7 p.m., there's food. Uh, so if you'd like to join for food, you can book by the end of today. Um, the details are there on the church, uh, church news email. Um, so book on for food, 7 p.m. But if you can't make it for food, then prayer starts at 7.45 p.m. So please do join us for that. Um, the other thing to mention is um, our term cards have been released. Uh, uh, happens, I guess, termly. And um, the, the term cards are, I, th I believe, hopefully, at the welcome desk across the way in the hall. Please grab your copies. Uh, do note down dates for your diaries and that sort of thing uh, and get an idea of all the things that are going on this term. Um, one thing to highlight is that the 12th of October, the Women's Conference, I think many are already aware uh, but you can now sign up for that, and the booking details are there um, on the weekly email as well. And then the final thing to mention is today uh, we have our picnic, uh, our final one of our summer, summer picnics. So do join us. Uh, if it's raining, I don't know whether it's raining, but maybe it is. If it rains, then we will still go ahead, bring your food, we'll sit inside, and we'll have a lovely time together. Um, so join us for the picnic today. In a moment, um, children are going to leave. Let me quickly explain where you're going. Um, so if you're uh, primary school age or below, uh, then you are heading out to the Warwick Hall. So if you don't know exactly where you're going, someone will be there to direct you, so do ask. Um, if you are secondary school age, then you're going to stay in for uh, the reading and the sermon, and then you're going to join me out um, after the sermon. Uh, we're going to have a discussion time, and I've got donuts for us as well. So... Um, that's, that's only for secondary school. Yeah, only for secondary school. So um, do uh, join me for that if you are in secondary school age. Um, let me pray, uh, as, and then the children can head out. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to gather as a church family. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the many different events that we have going on uh, this week and the weeks over this term. Lord, please would you uh, honour those. Please would you uh, help us to grow in our love and delight in you in those events. And Lord, please today, uh, would you help us as we hear from you through the scriptures. Uh, Lord, please, uh, young and old, would we be learning more of you, uh, growing in Christ-likeness and growing in love and delight for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Children, do head out. And if you're staying, you please feel free to come further forwards. Uh, but children, do head out to your groups.
We're, um, we're starting a, a new sermon series in the, in the book of James, and you can see from the notice sheet, if you, or the, the service sheet, if you have that, the title is The Single-Minded Christian. Uh, there's something of our devotion, our wholehearted devotion to God, and that's what we pray for um, together in our next song. Uh, we ask God for a wholehearted devotion to him. And there's this wonderful dynamic in the song where we, we pray, and then in the second verse, we're reminded of the gospel because our devotion to God isn't baseless. It isn't just asking us to be devoted to God out of our own strength, but it's because of the gospel that we can have this wholehearted devotion to God. So let's sing this prayer together now. Let's stand and sing, O great God of highest heaven. from the book of James, which is page 1,213, so 1,2,1,3. I'm going to read a little bit and then we're going to move on to chapter 4 on the next page. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So let's turn over to chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift up you up. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, thanks, Victoria. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, lovely to see you. Do keep James open. We'll be there in a moment. Uh, let me pray. Father, we do want to thank you very much indeed for this letter. We thank you that you inspired its writing. We thank you that you enabled Christians through the centuries to read it, understand it, and to live it. And our prayer over the next few weeks is it will do that sovereign work in us to your praise and glory for Jesus' sake. Amen. One of the uh, athletes who was the face of the GB team for the uh, Summer Olympics was Katarina Johnson-Thompson. In her social media bio for the games, she wrote this. Chronically indecisive, so I've adopted two surnames and the heptathlon. Now, for those who don't know, a heptathlon is a seven-event competition contested by women over two days. But I thought that was just rather delightful. And I'm sure a number of us will identify with it, won't we? Chronically indecisive. Uh, Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. And James will be telling us in his letter that we cannot be double-minded. Of course, some of us are naturally more decisive than others. Some will happily stick to a decision made. Others will constantly be wanting to change it and changing their minds. Have you been in a restaurant with somebody who's ordered something? They see something else come past them and think, no, I'd much rather have that. Regular occurrence. Now, in day-to-day life, that's quite entertaining, maybe a bit frustrating for others, but it doesn't really matter, does it? But it can be hugely destructive in our spiritual lives. How easily we move from the worship of the creator to the worship of the created thing. How easily we can have a public face and a private face, a church face and a work face, two minds, two souls. These friends and those friends, social media face to face. There are so many different ways in which we can reinvent ourselves. And it's very easy for the Jesus side of all of that, the link with that to get broken at certain times in our lives. Maybe when we head off to university, that's a great moment of reinvention, isn't it? Maybe when we move 
job or move house. And a broken link with those past situations may well be the reason for James's writing. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And many Christian believers left the church in Jerusalem, either because of the famine or because of persecution, and went into the Judean countryside. He's writing in the AD 40s and calling them to remember the Christian profession that they made and calling on them to live wholeheartedly for Jesus in that new place. Now, if you've uh, spent any time in James at all, you'll know that it's quite a different style of writing from the other New Testament letters. You don't get sort of 14-line single sentences like you get with uh, Paul, for instance. It's not telling a story, not a narrative. He moves from topic to topic and then comes back to some of them later. There's quite a lot about prayer. There's the famous stuff about the tongue, works and faith. He's got things to say about our diaries and about our wealth. In some ways, it's similar and has been likened to the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, to a book, say, like the book of Proverbs. But there is a unifying theme to it. And one commentator said, spiritual wholeness is the central concern of the letter. James wants his readers to stop compromising with the world, its values and behavior, and to live wholeheartedly for Jesus. We'll obviously see that over the next few weeks. But we're just going to concentrate on the the two passages this morning that use that uh, that phrase word, double-minded. And we're going to see how the single-minded believer will live by the wisdom of God and will live depending on God's grace. First of all then, the single-minded will live by God's wisdom. That's verses 1 to 8 of chapter 1. And God's gift to his people, to the church, is the word of truth, which enables us to keep going. God wants our undivided commitment because of what he has already done for us and given to us. Just glance across at verse 18 of chapter 1. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And as we go through the challenges and opportunities of everyday life, with that wholehearted commitment to him, then his choice of us will be revealed and clearly seen. Verse 2. For John, the result of a believer considering it pure joy will be perseverance. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. It's through keeping on, keeping going, keeping going through the difficulties that we will be mature, complete, not lacking in anything. Because through them, as we look to God, we will know his provision and care for us. We will know that they are indeed sufficient. That's the way to Christian maturity. Looking back to the Olympics and looking at what's going on in the Paralympics at the moment, how is it that those athletes have got to the point where they've got to? Well, they've got there through blood, sweat and tears, haven't they? They've got there through the boredom of repetitive training, the same exercises again and again and again. They've got there through coping with niggling injuries and all the rest of it. And through the completion of that training, they are able to be fit and ready for the competition when it comes. The boredom, the pain, all worth it, because that's how champions uh, are made. My talk's just disappeared. You may be pleased about that, but, uh, oh, it's come back again. <laughs> if you're still being double-minded about donuts, this could be a good moment to depart if you, if you want to do that. Now, of course, making sense of life, making sense of the difficulties, enjoying the tests, that seems a bit strange, doesn't it? What do we do? What's necessary if we're going to make sense in this world of these things? Well, have a look at verse 6. 
Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously without, to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I think that over the years, I've probably misused that verse, and I've applied it to maybe a particular problem or issue that uh, I'm struggling with at the time, rather than in this big picture sense that James is asking us to do here, related to double-mindedness, related to making sense of the world. So if there'd been a sort of a problem with the uh, church heating, we need wisdom to solve that, so let's pray. James says we can pray, that, that sort of thing. But no, James is applying something much more significant here. Because in the Old Testament, wisdom is the understanding how life, the universe, and everything actually works. The books of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs are uh, brilliant for, for showing us that and challenging us. Now, if something in my car isn't working properly, I have no understanding whatsoever what's going on. So what I do, I take it to the garage, and they tell me what's going on, and charge me a fortune for doing so. Uh, if I know that my body isn't working, which obviously happens a lot these days, I go to the doctor and they tell me, and tell me there's nothing they can do. That's just how it is. But when it comes to life, the universe, and everything, where do we go? Well, not to the mice. Some of you will get that, some of you won't, we'll move on. But to the creator. We go to the one who actually made the universe. We go to his word. It's his word of truth that enables us to make sense of life, make sense of our present difficulties and struggles. And Proverbs 2 backs this up. It says as we, try to God, as we cry to God in our ignorance and in our inability to make sense of things, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. In other words, life will make no sense without the Creator. You've got to start with Him. That's Proverbs 2's point, Solomon's point, that's James's point here. And maybe, if you're not sitting here this morning as a follower of Jesus, then here's a challenge for you. If you're struggling to make sense of life and it's just not adding up, then maybe you need to go back to the beginning. Come back to the Creator. Start with Him. Because God's wisdom, God's Word, enables us to make sense of life, enables us to go on trusting Him through all circumstances and situations and makes us more complete, makes us stable. Look at the, uh, the contrast with a person who is double-minded. In the middle of uh, verse 6, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. They have no anchor, no security, no constancy in their lives. And that will often be seen in the way they pick and choose what to believe. Well, of course, I like the verses about uh, God's love from Lamentations like we had earlier, but I'm not quite so keen about those that deal with sin and judgment. I like the promises about eternal life, but uh, I'm definitely not keen on those that say I should obey Jesus. Or it may be that we look at this world with the eyes of our unbelieving friends, neighbours and colleagues. We find it hard to accept God's sovereignty over the bad things the difficult things that happen. And we end up in some sort of weird dualism. Oh, that was sort of God's bit, and now this is the devil's bit, and who knows what's going on. We find it hard to understand how trials could be met with pure joy. Let's be clear. What uh, James is doing here is addressing a basic and constant inconsistency rather than an occasional doubt or lapse. All of us, because of our human nature, will doubt things, won't we? I can't be the only person in the room who has woken up in the morning and thought, the good news about Jesus can't possibly be true. That will always be there for us as sinful people. But we're not to live there. That's James's point. 
We can know this single-mindedness. We can have this completeness, this wholehearted devotion to Jesus. We can look to a generous God who teaches us faithfully and consistently through his word, grants us the wisdom we need to see the way the world works and our place in it. The single-minded then will live by God's wisdom. Turn over to, uh, to chapter 4. The single-minded will depend on God's grace. And we notice here that the God of the Bible is a jealous God. Look at verse 4. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? James is here picking up an Old Testament theme. Well, the Old Testament people of God, Israel, were betrothed to their God. The trouble was they uh, preferred the idols and ran off after idols and therefore committed spiritual adultery. And James is saying, with our friendship with the world, we share the same unfaithfulness. We are the same adulterous people. Ah, We saw in Titus over August, didn't we, that grace leads to godliness. Here James is putting the same point in a slightly different way. You cannot be a friend of the world. Have a look at, uh, just glance back across the column to chapter, verse 14 of chapter 3. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. To be a friend of the world is to say, I would rather go the devil's way. I would rather follow what his followers do and teach and prize. The way of the world is demonic in origin. And the devil, as we know, is the father of lies. And therefore, rather than making accommodation with the devil, coming to terms with him, we are to resist the devil. Verse 7. And of course, his work is seen in the proud. Verse 6, Scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. The proud says in their heart, there is no God. The proud knows better than God. The proud relies on self-confidence and seeks self-fulfillment. Therefore, God opposes the proud. Rather, we are to draw near to God. Verse 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. This is repentance. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughs to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves. I'm sure there are many things that you can think back to that You've taken delight in, you've enjoyed, you've been amused about. But maybe now as you look back, you're actually ashamed of them. You now recognize they're things to be mourned over. I had a uh, similar experience like that uh, only this last week. We uh, we drove down to spend a few days with friends in uh, Cornwall. And as we drove down the A30, we passed a sign to the Fingal Glen Hotel. And I remembered a departmental annual dinner at the Fingal Glen Hotel, where along with the other postgrads, I drank too much, and along with the other postgrads, threw up in the car on the way home. It was a great, fun evening. We really enjoyed ourselves. We had a lovely time. But actually, that was something to be grieved over and mourned over. I wonder how Jermaine Genus feels this morning, given all that he's lost, because of some WhatsApps that he probably quite enjoyed writing and receiving, because of some encounters that, again, pleased him but look what they've cost him is he mourning 
over those things. So you see, we must take friendship with the world seriously. James will talk at the end of the letter about those who have wandered from the truth. We must take our wandering from the truth seriously. We must take our sin seriously. And we mourn, we wail, we grieve because of the beginning of verse 6. He gives us more grace. His grace is sufficient. When we humble ourselves, when we repent, he shows us favor. He will lift us up, verse 10. So there's a very simple choice for us here, isn't there? Do we want the joy of the moment? Do we want the favor of family, friends, and colleagues? Or do we want the favor of God and the security of eternity with him? Verse 12 of chapter 1. The crown of life that the Lord promises to those who love him. And as we think back to the the joy in trials, let's remember that God's grace is not just for that first occasion of repentance, that first prayer uttered in that way. It's a constant provision, a continual reminder that God is sovereign, he's in charge, and he meets our every need. It's why at the beginning of our time school on Sunday, we start with confession, make sure we're in the right place in the right relationship. So all of our life is under his sovereign control. In all of our life, we meet his grace. A friend who is uh, recovering from uh, blood cancer and a bone marrow transplant uh, sent me uh, this, uh, blog this recently. On YouTube, I saw a talk to potential missionaries. You don't plan your life by John Piper. I watched a bit and realized he's right. I did not plan my life. I didn't plan where I was born or who my family are or what's in my DNA. I didn't plan to enjoy sports. I didn't plan to go to any of the places that I've worked in. I didn't plan to develop myelofibrosis just before retirement. God is our shepherd and he plans our lives. Such is the humility of the single-minded, knowing who's in charge, knowing who will provide for us in all situations, because they're the situations he has chosen for us. And we will do that because of the assurance of verse 6. He gives us more grace. His sure and certain promise to all those who will reject friendship with the world. All those who will commit themselves wholeheartedly to him. The God who jealously longs that we will be single-minded followers. The single-minded will always depend on God's grace. So as we go through this letter, we're going to see that worked out in different ways and different situations because James wants us, he wants his hearers, to be whole Christians, single-minded in our love and service of him. So let's seek God's word and God's wisdom, always depending on his grace. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, we thank you that your word and your grace are completely sufficient for all of our needs. And we thank you that as the sovereign Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are ruler of everything. Please, Father, may we submit to you and to your rule and rejoice in your grace and wisdom all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Our next song says in the chorus, to this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. May that be our prayer, not just uh, for this song, but uh, for the rest of the life God has granted to us. Please stand. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no
Folks, um, please do take a seat as we turn to prayer. Thank you, musicians, for being so beautiful and for playing so well. It's lovely. Um, first, the conflict, uh, the collect, conflict, collect. Let's pray this um, in our hearts as we read these words together. Almighty God, whose only Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and who reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We carry on in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we have this extraordinary privilege in this part of the world of passing through countryside where at this time of year we see harvest in full swing. We see people night and day mowing fields and gathering crops. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we see this spectacle, that our hearts would be turned to remember that you are the Lord of the harvest. To know that actually all life is your gift. All life. The lives that walk up and down Burford High Street, the lives that are driving the tractors, the lives of those that we spend our time with at work or at school or at university. Life is your gift to us. We ask that you'd help us to hold that in our hearts and to be conscious of it constantly, but especially at this time. Heavenly Father, as we think about the harvest and we think that all life comes from you and we give you praise and thanks for your provision, we also want to repent of the way that so often we chase the blessings of God rather than the blesser. We know that we live in a land of compromise. We are stupidly well off in this nation and in this little enclave of this nation. In global terms, we have so much. And yet our hearts too often turn to grumbling in place of gratitude. And we know the warnings of Scripture that this compromise will take our eye off you. This compromise will lead to idolatry. The Bible is very clear about that. And we pray for your spirit to rule in our hearts and to pull us back from the brink of idolatry whenever that comes close. Forgive us for the times when our commitment to you is compromised. And when we become complacent about the lives we live and all that you've given us. Heavenly Father, we pray for the global church. And uh, in particular, I want to pray for a thing called the Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization, which is taking place in September in Korea, where 5,000 evangelical leaders from 200 different countries will meet together for a week to seek unity with each other before the cross, to seek to encourage each other in gospel ministry around the world. Heavenly Father, I pray for your spirit to dwell in the hearts of all those who attend, that they would come without uh, pride, that they would come with humility, that they would come willing to learn, to listen, to be generous. I pray that this conference, which has so much potential for good, would not be dominated by the world's values. And we pray for fruit to come from this. We thank you, Father, that actually the world is upside down 
in terms of our own understanding, that there are many more Christians in the global south or in the parts of the world that we think are missionary areas than there are in our own nation, in our own continent. And I pray that we would be mature enough in Christ to welcome those from other nations who want to come to our land and proclaim the glory of God and show us how we can live in a way uh, which serves him and magnifies the gospel presence here. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, Christians in areas of conflict and particularly for Christians across lines of political conflict. I pray for uh, dear friends, sisters and brothers in Christ in Russia who feel persecuted in their own nation and who feel persecuted by other Christians. Evangelicals hounded by the Orthodox Church or cut off from their sisters and brothers speaking the same language across a border. I pray for sisters and brothers in Ukraine and I pray for their hearts to be so open to receive your love and your grace that they would hold no argument with their fellow believers in Russia. I pray for Christians in Armenia and Azerbaijan and that wretched 25-year war that goes on there. I pray that the truth of being family in Christ would cross over borders and that you would raise up brave and courageous people who see fellowship in Christ as far greater uh, than national identity. I pray for Israel and Gaza, acknowledging that the largest group of Christians in Israel are Arab people. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, for those sisters and brothers. They are our family, finding themselves in a world torn apart. I pray for their protection and for their safety. Heavenly Father, I pray for our nation here. I pray that this government that we have now would allow Christian wisdom to permeate its culture and its ideology so that our society may be preserved from corruption and greed and from injustice. I pray for the church in our nation. I pray that we would find unity in Christ across perhaps sometimes some old-fashioned lines of division, that we wouldn't be so bound to denominations um, and ideas like that, but we would find unity with those who love you, who seek to know you, who seek to have the Spirit of God within their hearts and the Word of God open for their minds. I pray that you'd help us to find unity with each other so that there would be a united gospel witness within this nation. And Father, the, the complexities of denominational um, struggles are so great, but we pray, Heavenly Father, we pray for redemption of the Church of England. Uh, even if it means cutting down, even if it means losing its place, we just pray, Heavenly Father, that this institution, which to so many apparently represents the truth of the gospel, would be redeemed from its folly and its divisiveness and the ambition that seems to rule in the hearts of many. Father, we pray for our own church here. We pray that you would help us know what it means to be salt and light in this area. Help us to support the little congregations in tiny villages. Help us to live lives of integrity that those who work and run businesses in this area would be known as people of honesty, of trustworthiness. We pray that this would be a place that people are drawn to, not only because of the quality of the music, but because of the outstanding nature of our lives. And so we pray for those who serve us in leadership, that you'd help them to be outstanding examples for us. 
but help us not to just leave it all in their hands. Heavenly Father, please, by your grace, equip us for your works of ministry in this area. We pray also for our lives in the church. We think of Sam Jackson, and we thank you that, um, thank you that the, uh, the growth that was found in him, the tumor that was found in him, has not been proven to be more dangerous than it is, but we pray for the surgery that has to remove that and for the prosthetic shoulder that he will be given. We pray for him and his fiancée, Becca, that their um, confidence in you would not be diminished through this time of anguish. We pray for the family, and we thank you that they are part of our family, and we pray that they would know your love through our love. Father, we also pray for those who are going to university or returning to university, for those who are starting work, for those who are changing school, for those perhaps who are going back to work after a summer break and not looking forward to it. Heavenly Father, I just pray for each of us who are in transition, that you would be with us and that your truth would remain our truth as we move into a new phase of life. O oh Lord of the harvest, thank you that by your grace you choose to use us in your work of harvesting. Thank you for the great commission to make disciples in all nations. Forgive us for our compromise. By your grace, through your spirit, through our fellowship with each other, through the teaching we receive, please cause us to be undivided in our love for you, our worship of you, our joy in the company of the saints, and our desire to see Christ glorified in our lives and in our nation. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Folks, let's say together the uh, Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I think we're going to stand and sing.
Please do be seated. If you'd like to pray over anything that uh, has been uh, said this morning that has particularly struck you, anything that uh, is just troubling at the moment, then uh, do make your way to the uh, chapel with the glass doors and folk will be there to, uh, to pray with you. Everyone's welcome over at the uh, Warwick Hall for uh, refreshments and, uh, of course, uh, lunch uh, after that if you'd like to stay on. Let's close with a prayer. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip us with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.